Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Budget Primer Town Hall with the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. My name is David Schaefer. I'm the Research Director here at GBPI. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Uh, this is always an exciting night. We get the opportunity to talk about the upcoming FY 2023 budget, which is the most important moral document that the state of Georgia puts out every year. Uh, I want to remind you that our hashtag is Our Primer, Your Budget. And without further ado, I want to go into our starring lineup. And in order of appearance, I'm going to introduce our panel of policy analysts. Uh, first up, we're going to have Danny Canso. He's the Senior Policy Analyst for Tax and Budget. He is also the Legislative Policy Manager here at GBPI. After Danny, we're going to have Dr. Stephen Owens. He's our Senior Policy Analyst for K-12 Education. Following Stephen, we've got Ife Finch-Floyd. She's a Senior Economic Justice Policy Analyst. And after Ife Finch-Floyd, we've got Ray Calfani. He's the Policy Analyst for Worker Justice and Criminal Legal Systems here at GBPI. And following Ray Calfani, we've got Leah Chan. She's the Senior Health Policy Analyst here at GBPI. So uh, we're going to walk you through different aspects of the state budget. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to have some opportunity for some question and answer from the audience. And that will be your opportunity to ask our analysts about your state budget, what's coming up, what the process looks like, what we're watching, what our priorities are going to be in the upcoming legislative session. Before we get in, there's going to be a, a couple of links that are going to be dropped in the chat along the way. Uh, some of these are things that we would like to point your attention to in the state budget that are important uh, in terms of racial equity, uh, opening up more holistic opportunity for all Georgians. And there's one I want to provide right off the top from immigration policy analyst Crystal Munoz. Uh, she recently wrote a blog called World Refugee Day and Immigrant Heritage Month, How Welcoming is Georgia? There's some budget-related approaches in there on how to make Georgia more welcoming to immigrants and refugees. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone off to Danny Canso, and he's going to talk a little bit more about our revenue and budget trends for FY 2023. Thank you very much and welcome. Great. Thank you so much, David, and, and good evening to all of those joining us. Uh, we're so excited to share with you our FY 2023 budget that will take us through the budget that took effect, of course, July 1st of this year, uh, and, and that we uh, is the current year budget and that we expect to, uh, of course, be amended uh, when the legislature takes effect in January. Uh, so first, we'll start by discussing the revenue uh, and, and, of course, uh, the, the budget affects all 10.8 10, 10 million Georgians in communities across our state. Uh, so next slide. So just to begin, 73% uh, of every dollar that the state of Georgia spends goes to fund either public education or health care. Uh, you can see that the lion's share goes to pre-K and K through 12 education, uh, $11.2 billion, uh, about 40%. That combined with higher education, uh, about $4.7 billion that goes to our state's university system and technical colleges, uh, primarily funded through the, the lottery, uh, that, that comprises a majority of the state budget. Uh, then healthcare, to, to provide healthcare for about 2 million Georgians, uh, primarily children uh, and, and pregnant women, uh, it, through Medicaid, the state spends about $6.2 billion a year. And then if we combine things like debt service uh, for infrastructure projects, human services, public safety, the courts, uh, and the criminal legal system, that takes us up to about 95% of every dollar that the state spends. So uh, most state dollars go very closely to Georgians, core services, uh, things that affect our state really significantly. And that's why uh, revenues are so important uh, to make those core investments in our state. Uh, so next slide. And the income tax is the largest source of state revenue. So just over half of all of the revenues that the state of Georgia raises uh, to pay for those services and programs come from the income tax. Most of that is from the individual income tax. And that is the most reliable, uh, strongest source of revenue that we have. We, of course, have seen a spike in income tax revenues. Uh, those are closely tied to employment and salaries, of course. So as we've seen, um, you know, that, that, that labor market, uh, a, a little bit of movement in wages, we've also seen that in income tax, and that is very important 
uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those pending tax changes uh, later on. The sales tax uh, is the next largest source of revenue, about a quarter of all of the revenue that Georgia raises. Uh, that we've also seen rise uh, as folks have had more money in their pockets from some of those uh, boosts given by the federal government uh, under the American Rescue Plan. Uh, of course, in addition to checks uh, that, that went to almost all Georgians, we, we saw the child tax credit uh, is a very powerful source uh, in increasing family incomes, the earned income tax credit, unemployment benefits, uh, all of those help to sustain the economy, uh, keep the sales tax strong, uh, and, and then a mix of taxes, other taxes and fees uh, that, that we'll look at on the next slide. Uh, and then uh, a, a, about uh, a, about 5% of state revenues come from the state lottery, uh, and, and the, the state also collects its gas tax, which is dedicated to infrastructure. Uh, next slide. So this is a more detailed look at those revenues. Uh, you can see personal and corporate income tax revenues, about half, uh, followed by the sales tax. And then these are the largest other taxes and fees that the state has, uh, the, the TABT on, on car purchases, in taxes on insurance premiums, uh, the tobacco tax, tax on alcohol, and then these designated funds uh, like the motor fuel tax, which uh, is dedicated to infrastructure. That has been suspended since the beginning of the fiscal year uh, and, and is set to remain suspended at least through Labor Day. Uh, and, and so right now we're supplementing those, those funds from uh, basically the, the surplus that the state is running uh, in, in these other areas. And so right now, actually, this $30.2 billion revenue estimate for the current year, uh, among the largest source of revenues that, that have already been reported, the income tax, the sales tax, uh, the, the fuel tax and lottery funds, we actually collected last year about 20% more than the governor's revenue estimate for the current year. And that's very important because in Georgia, the governor has unilateral authority to set the revenue estimate, which caps uh, the amount that the General Assembly can appropriate for the budget. And, and so right now there is that, that really large kind of historic gap between where we are in the revenue estimate for the current year that, that has driven the budget cap uh, that, that, that you'll hear about in, in all of these areas, uh, and also what we collected last year and what we're likely to collect this year, which gives us real opportunity going forward uh, to, to catch up on some of those missed investments. Uh, next slide. And so here uh, you can just see now when we add in federal funds uh, about uh, $27 billion, we, we get the full uh, $58 billion budget. Uh, and, and on the, as we go to the next slide, uh, we can take a closer look at, at, at some of those federal funds. So among uh, $17.7 billion in federal funds, uh, about $10 billion goes to fund healthcare, uh, a smaller share uh, goes to, to pre-K and K through 12 schools, uh, higher education institutions, uh, and then the, hum the Department of Human Services uh, gets uh, a about a matching share in federal funds to, to what we put in state funds. Uh, and, and then there are some smaller areas uh, throughout the budget uh, that, that just get about $600 million in federal funds. But you can see Medicaid is really the lion's share there. Uh, along with education. Uh, next slide. So the, the American Rescue Plan uh, was a really big boost to both the state economy and also in jump-starting areas of investment uh, that, that have been really both areas of need prior to the pandemic uh, and, and, and a direct response to avoid what could have been a really deep recession. Uh, so actually, since the, the primer was published, there's been about one point $2 billion allocated uh, to get a direct payments uh, up to $350 billion, uh, up to $350 for recipients of SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid. Um, that is in line with a, a priority that we've advocated for a long time, the earned income tax credit, as well as cash assistance. Uh, and then the next largest area, about $400 million in economic grants uh, to nonprofits and other organizations across the state, uh, about $220 million to hospitals and assisted living facilities uh, on the front lines of the pandemic, about $400 million to help upgrade the water and sewer infrastructure across the state, uh, about $400 million for broadband, uh, which has been a really core area of need uh, across North and South Georgia, uh, 
for about a million Georgians that don't have adequate access uh, to high speed internet, and then about $100 million to address the backlog uh, of cases. So that's about half of our total funding that's been allocated, and, and that leaves about $2.5 billion, billion remaining that the state will be able to spend uh, up until the end of 2024. Next slide. So now uh, that, that kind of covers our revenue system, the, the, the large areas of the budget. And, and in this series, we'll take a closer look at uh, how some of the trends have unfolded in, in a really volatile period throughout the COVID pandemic, uh, and also in, in, in what's been a little bit of an economic rebound uh, over the last two years. So the state has really prioritized building up uh, very large balances in, in, in both its standard revenue shortfall reserve state savings account, uh, where the state is allowed to have up to 15% uh, of, of what it collected in revenues over the last year. So that comes out to about $5 billion that we have stored in that account. And actually now we have about $5 billion in what's labeled an undesignated surplus account. Uh, and, and that is because the governor, again, has unilateral authority to set those revenue estimates. And, and we have just seen uh, really large rebounds, both in 2021, where the state collected about four and a half billion dollars more than it spent. And in the last year, where according to the most recent numbers we have, uh, we know that the state collected about seven billion dollars more in 2022. Uh, again, the fiscal year that ended June 30th uh, than it did, than, than it spent. And so that has driven this really large balance in the savings account. And as part of the governor's authority to set the revenue estimate, uh, the, the governor has the power to, to make those adjustments. So that's something that we're going to be watching very closely uh, in January. Next slide. And, and here again, a, a, another trend that we've seen is tremendous growth in the amount of revenue that's being lost to tax breaks across the board. So the film tax credit is the largest tax break the state offers uh, to corporations. Actually, the, the most recent numbers that we have suggest that the state uh, gave up more than $1.2 billion last year in film tax credits is set to again, uh, repeat that. And then the largest tax breaks go to uh, insurance companies, uh, corporations through the jobs tax credits. And uh, another tax credit that was created under the uh, Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 that, that we've looked at eliminating and, and hope to eliminate that goes to multinational corporations, uh, over $200 million lost to that now. Uh, next slide. And, and, and now, just as we talk about other tax changes, it's also important to note uh, that, that we see an increasingly regressive tax changes harming Black Georgians and people of color uh, the most. So already we know uh, that, that white Georgians earn a disproportionate share uh, of, of high income, are overrepresented among the top income groups, while Black and Hispanic Georgians uh, are underrepresented uh, and overrepresented in the lower income groups. And, and, and that really matters when we talk about regressive changes that give really outsized gains to the top income groups uh, and, and, and little, if anything, uh, to, to those making the median income or lower, and that helps to grow the racial wealth gap and has a host of other unfortunate effects across the state. Next slide. And, and in the last legislative year, a, a really regressive plan was passed to move the state to a flat income tax over seven years beginning in 2024. And, and what we see is that over two thirds of all of those benefits, about $2 billion in costs when the plan is fully implemented would go to those in the top 20%. And actually about 40% would go just to those in the top 5% earning over $250,000 a year. And so this chart just shows how outsized those gains are uh, for top incomers, particularly those at the very top compared to all other Georgians. Uh, and, and, and when we think about just the true cost of, of implementing these really regressive, harmful uh, income tax cuts, particularly uh, to our largest source of revenue that, that would take us to a flat tax. Uh, it, it's also just important to consider that we're also uh, growing the racial wealth gap 
uh, and, and really uh, not giving those resources to Georgians who could, who could use them the most and to the state uh, to, to do things like invest in healthcare and education, uh, but rather losing that revenue to, to those who are already at the very top. Uh, and now we'll transition uh, to my colleague, Stephen Owens, uh, to talk about our public education system and, and Georgia's FY 2023 budget. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, yeah, the, the budget for K-12 education this year, we're looking at $10.7 billion. Um, I want to talk about uh, two areas specifically that have seen significant change. But, but before we do that, let's talk about the big things that y'all probably seen yourselves. Um, $287 million was added into the current budget to raise teacher pay by $2,000. Um, a shade under 400 million was added into the budget to get rid of dedicated cuts to public education. These are necessary investments into our public school system. Um, and it ends this kind of consistent pattern we've had over two decades in Georgia to make the first and worst cuts to our public education system. And the points that Danny made, it's hard to see that if we continue to uh, cut our legs out from underneath us, as far as our revenue is concerned, um, that those that when we have another down year, um, as we will in the future, if we don't have a strong revenue base, the first and worst cut again is going to be our K-12 schools, because as you saw, that is where a plurality of the dollars are going to um, in our state budget, and that is not uncommon nationwide. Now, the two areas that I wanna focus in uh, specific, specifically, um, first is in uh, the amount of funding that the state is sending outside of its public school system to private schools via vouchers. So let's go to that next slide. Um, this is uh, two vouchers. Uh, which is public funds that is going directly to private schools. GVPI has a longstanding opposition uh, to policies such as vouchers um, for many reasons, um, because these are uh, a policy that does not have any plan for our rural students that don't live near a private school, fails to adequately support our students with disabilities, um, because uh, once you take a voucher, away from public schools, you lose out on protections like under those in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Uh, similar for our English learner students, um, it offers nothing to parents who might feel uncomfortable with sending their kids to a school if it uh, was started as a segregation academy. Um, and it also uh, actively takes money away from our public school system, which educates 90% of all students in the state of Georgia. Last year, the um, Georgia Department of Audits and Accounts wrote an audit of um, one of the two vouchers, the more, uh, the larger voucher that we have in Georgia, the Qualified Education Expense Tax Credit, and recognized that there are a lot of opportunities, opportunities for legislative accountability. Um, there are opportunities for the misuse of the funds that the state is sending to pass-through organizations to then go to uh, private education through uh, through payments to parents. Uh, instead of making um, real change to that voucher, lawmakers added an additional $20 million per year that you'll see um, that if we hit that cap, uh, which we're projected to do, um, we're looking at $155 million that will go in fiscal year, uh, in this next year, to private educational facilities. Um, that is a jump from obviously $5 million that we had in 2008. The cumulative effect of this is $1.3 billion uh, sent to private schools since 2008. Let's go to the next slide. Now, on the other side, um, this is a uh, equalization grant, which we continue to watch at GVPI because this is the amount of funding that goes to low wealth school districts. Um, so because of the uniquely way, uniquely American way that we budget uh, public schools in the United States, um, your funding is uh, part state dollars. And uh, that's where, that's going to be your largest amount of money to your public schools. The next largest is the amount you're getting in local property taxes. And I don't think I'm surprising anyone when I say that the amount you can earn in local property taxes is going to look very different 
um, depending on just how much the houses and properties are worth in your community. Um, so this is an equalizing grant the state has to support those school districts that fall in the bottom half of local property wealth per child. Um, this is a grant that was lowered after the Great Recession, not because of earnings from the formula, but because uh, lawmakers uh, did not have the funds and did not raise the revenue in order to meet the formula's requirements. So then they changed the formula to lower it. Um, this is the first time we've seen it lowered uh, since the Great Recession, and it's because of formula drops. And there's a couple different ways to use this. Um, this drop in funds, which as you can see is significant for next year, um, could mean that uh, the houses and properties in our lower wealth school districts have not only gained ground um, and increased, uh, but they've increased at a faster rate than our uh, richer, higher wealth school districts. So this could show some progressive growth that uh, local school districts, especially lower wealth school districts, don't need as much from the state in order to equalize. That's also the possibility that we're seeing the result of the state giving property tax breaks to companies to go into lower wealth school districts and that school districts are not seeing the results of those property taxes yet. It's something we're gonna to continue to watch to make sure that all our schools have the resources they need to educate um, all children appropriately. Let's go to the next slide. Just real quick, um, we have been adding on um, and having additions into the pre-K program for a few years where it's getting back to kind of that per student amount that we saw uh, before the Great Recession, um, including $2,000 pay raises for lead teachers and assistant teachers. I wanted to make sure that we put that in context of what the state is putting towards um, public kindergarten, just one grade above, because this is a $1,700 per child difference. And you can see it in the way that we pay for our lead teachers in the amount of classrooms we have for students. Um, and so there's still a lot of room to grow. I don't want to say anything against these uh, state infusions to the pre-kindergarten program, um, except that there's still a long way to go before we have this kind of adequate amount in this necessary early child education program. Let's go to the next slide because this is an appropriate kind of transition into what pays for pre-K, which is our lottery funds. The state allocated uh, $1.4 billion in lottery funds, which sit uh, separate from other state funds. Um, and it's meant specifically pay for pre-K, HOPE, Zelle, and a few other uh, grants and programs in higher education. Um, of that $1.4 billion, the vast majority is going to Hope and Zell scholarships. That's $900 million uh, for the coming year. Then $400 million for pre-K. Um, the state has to set a certain amount in lottery reserves. You can see it in that dark blue bar. That's $618 million that sits in lottery reserves. But sitting on top of that, is over $1 billion in unrestricted reserves. This is the amount, this is funds that the state lawmakers can set to almost any task. And um, since we've had the departure of the indomitable Jennifer Lee, I am now going to make this uh, the thing that I am tilting, the windmill I'm tilting towards, which is we need to have a strong plan for this over $1 billion uh, to uh, make equitable improvements uh, in Georgians' lives. So let's move next to USG funding, where you can see that we have um, continued along that pre-pandemic path that um, once you control for inflation, the amount that's going to in 23 uh, to the University System of Georgia, which y'all know primarily is going uh, to our uh, institutes, colleges and universities for uh, normal college operations, that we're now kind of in line with the 2009, 2010 amount. One uh, amazing addition in this program is $230 million that lawmakers put in to get rid of the special institutional fee. Now, uh, the SIF was created in 2009 because the state did not have the money it needed to pay for um, our higher education system and really passed down that fee to individual students. Um, it represented about 40% of student mandatory student fees 
Um, getting rid of that is going to make a real difference uh, in students' po pocketbooks. Glad to see that uh, taken off of the burden of individual students. And then the final slide I have for you is uh, TCSG. Um, there's a small enrollment dip into uh, 2021. The state expect in 2022, the state expects that enrollment to hold steady for 23. You can see with the amount of funding that's provided to TCSG um, that it's getting back to 2008, uh, 2000, 2007 and 2008 level. Um, we might see an increase in enrollment in TCSG moving forward. Um, you can see that the amount of students that went to uh, these colleges increased in the Great Recession. That's pretty common uh, that we see increased enrollments uh, when there's a recession as people are more likely to uh, go back to school and burnish their skills. Um, but now I am going to pass it on to my colleague, Ife Finch Floyd, and she is going to talk through the human services budget. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, so first I'm gonna provide an overview of the uh, Department of Human Services budget. And then I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about staffing um, and the issues around staffing at the Department of Human Services. Next slide, please. So the Department of Human Services reaches millions of Georgians and particularly those who are most vulnerable, like those who are at risk of neglect and abuse um, or those who struggle with financial hardship. So it includes programs like child welfare services, foster care and um, adoption services, and then public benefit administration and eligibility determinations and elder care services. So foster care and child welfare services together, um, as you can see in this graph, make up more than 60% of the DHS budget. And then low income support programs um, and services, again, this is, these are things like cash assistance, food assistance, energy assistance, um, and doing those eligibility determinations for those programs, as well as for Medicaid. Um, that makes up the, the second uh, largest share um, at about 15%. Um, so the total uh, DHS budget for FY 2023 is about $920 million. And that's about $103 million more than what we saw in FY 2022. And DHS is one of the largest um, agencies in terms of the workforce, if not the largest. If, if, if it doesn't have the largest workforce uh, among all other agencies. So about more than a third of, um, of the increase over FY 2022 was spent on this cost $5,000 cost of living adjustment um, to all state workers, uh, qualified workers. Um, so it was around um, 38 to $40 million for um, in DHS. I want to highlight just a few other um, spending um, increases um, in the DHS budget as well. So there was about $28 million for a, for a excuse me, for a 10% increase in the provider rate for foster care parents and group home providers. And then there was an additional $3 million increase um, for um, the annual foster care clothing allowance, boosting that by about $275 per child. So together, these move in the right direction to support group home providers and foster parents. Um, and this is a really big issue because the state has struggled to retain and recruit qualified and trained foster care parents. And in fact, some parents have been you know, have felt that they have, you know, to move away from their duties because um, they could not um, support um, uh, some of the foster care children who may have high um, special needs um, or mental health issues. Um, and that has been a major concern um, for this for the state. So again, these move in the right direction, but we need to think about um, other supports um, and, inc and hopefully increasing the provider rate over time to make sure that group home providers and foster parents have what they need to actually care for, 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 for ch the children. 
There's another $3 million um, for pilots and other programming um, to support children who are at risk of entering the foster care system, as well as children who receive child welfare services um, and also who have autism. There's another $4 million for aftercare programs and um, $3 million to bolster and um, expand the state services for uh, dementia and, um, and Alzheimer's services. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit um, to talk about the staffing levels um, at, at DHS. So I noted before that um, many of the staff received, um, most almost all the staff received that $5,000 pay increase. Um, and state officials have noted that that has helped ease some of the turnover. But like other state agencies, DHS has um, experienced a dramatic uh, staffing decline over the past few years. So in fiscal year 2019, for example, DHS staffing levels were about at about uh, 9,800. And um, Commissioner Brose, um, head of DHS, mentioned earlier this year um, that she was seeing staffing levels at about 8,300. So that's about a 1,500 de um, uh, person decline in staffing levels. Um, so not only does the agency need more staff just to, to do its day-to-day -day business, right, there's also going to be and a massive administrative undertaking that's going to be uh, that's forthcoming in the next year, and that is Medicaid unwinding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit of background. During the public health emergency, during the pandemic, uh, the federal government allowed states to extend enrollment. Um, so during that uh, for Medicaid. Uh, so during that time. Um, Medicaid in Georgia grew by about 24%. Um, so when the end of the pub, when when the public health emergency ends, which um, right now is slated for the fall, October, I believe, um, the state is going to have several months to reconsider um, the millions of enrollees on Medicaid and CHIP or Peach Care. Um, this is going to be a massive, massive undertaking. Um, and there is a significant risk as well. So over, DBPI estimates that over 450,000 Georgians are at risk of losing coverage, either due to now being ineligible or due to procedural reasons. So these are avoidable reasons. Um, and Black and Latinx children and families are the most likely to be negatively impacted by either losing their coverage altogether or experiencing a harmful gap in coverage. So um, one of the one of the ways to to try to address this and to make sure that we you know um, people we we um, have as little harm done to families and children and individuals as possible is to make sure that staffing levels are at an appropriate level. Um, so that, that means the state is going to um, have to hire more people. Now, um, DHS has had some hiring um, fairs around the state and, and that is, that's good, but it's gonna take a little bit more and that's likely going to require a lot more state investment um, in hiring for DHS. Um, so I'm gonna pause there uh, to make sure my colleague, Ray Calfani, has enough time to share a little bit more about the Department of Labor. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Ife. And once again, I'm Ray Califani, policy analyst handling our work with justice and criminal legal systems portfolio. I'm going to change gears a little bit and have a much less visual um, uh, display with you and just have some more, a more conversational uh, discussion around Department of Labor's uh, 2023, fiscal year 2023 budget. So I'm going to start off by just giving you just three overarching points. And then I'm just going to go into a conversation to revisit those points along with some other things about where we are with, with the Department of Labor's budget. So, you know, for one, Department of Labor's, Department of Labor's fiscal year 2023 budget is $6.1 million. That's $6.8 million smaller than last than the last fiscal year, 2022. And that's primarily due to this to a transfer of state workforce development program funds to the state's technical college system. 
Another thing that took place, another major thing, you know, when it comes came to spending for FY 2023, you know, as part of one time cost of living adjustments for, for Department of Labor staff, you know, state lawmakers added two hundred and thirty thousand dollars all to, to FY 2023 spending. And then one other main thing, and I'm definitely going to get into this, is that throughout all the spending decisions that were made in FY 2023, no, ad, there, there were no added long term state investments nor any one-time investments that were made to UI modernization within the Georgia Department of Labor. So with that said, I'm going to just, you know, just talk just in more detail about where we are with the Department of Labor. So as I said, you know, Department of Labor's 2023, fiscal year 2023 budget is $6.1 million, nearly $6.8 million smaller than FY 2022. That's part of that, that that's, that's primarily due to this transfer of state workforce development program funds to Georgia's technical college system which is now going to house all of the state's workforce training for dislocated workers, um, you know, which includes, you know, career counseling, providing available job market information, job search assistance, referrals to employers, and occupational skills training. And this $6.8 million transfer of workforce development program funds, you know, that maintains nearly $100,000 in state spending cuts to administrative staffing capacity that, that have been in place now, these cuts have been in place since fiscal year 2020 spending was amended in the early phases of the COVID pandemic. And the maintenance of these cuts contributed to the reduction of 17 vacant positions since fiscal year 2020. Now, also, you know, with the transfer of workforce development related spending out of the Department of Labor to the Technical College System of Georgia, the $6.1 million in state spending for the Georgia Department of Labor is now dedicated to two divisions, and that's the Department Administration Division and Unemployment Insurance Division. Now, you know, the other divisions within the Department of Labor, they're, they're fully federal, fully federally funded. Um, and you know, while East Department of Labor Division administers programs through a significant portion of federal funding, you know, which you know for FY 2023 is going to cover 87% of the of the of the spending when it, of the, the funding for uh Department Administration and the Unemployment Insurance Division. Um, still, state allocations provide dedicated funding sources to maintain the efficiency of Georgia's Department of Labor through the ebbs and flows of federal funding. And then, you know, as I mentioned, you know, one of those major points, you know, across those two divisions of the Department, Administra Department Administration Division and the Unemployment Insurance Division within the Department of Labor, um, as part of one-time cost of living adjustments for, for Department of Labor staff, lawmakers added $230,000 um, in fiscal year 2023 spending. Now, it's yet to be the Determine like how the transfer of workforce development program funds, you know, which was done, um, you know, with the intention of streamlining operations by placing all workforce training in one stop shops and other facilities that are managed by the technical college system, you know, it, it's still yet to be determined how that's going to impact the delivery of workforce training across the state. But, you know, transfer funding and operations, you know, with reduced staffing capacity still poses questions about the technical college system's ability to meet the personalized needs of dislocated workers with unique employment barriers that come with unique career counseling, occupational skills training needs. Now, you know, regarding state spending for the programs that remain, those two divisions that, you know, that, that I mentioned earlier, you know, there have been no added long-term state investments, you know, nor any one-time investments made to the Georgia Department of Labor. Now, Despite billions of available fiscal recovery funds from the, Amer from the American Rescue Plan Act that remain available, none of them have been specifically requested nor allocated to modernize Department of Labor operations. Despite the hard lessons, you know, the agency administrators and Georgia lawmakers received in the past COVID-19 induced recession, as well as the Great Recession. Now, although it wasn't approved by the governor's negative economic impact committee, the only one-time funding that Department of Labor of agency administrators requested was for $800 million to relieve employers, not workers, from some of their financial, from, from you know, some of the employers' financial responsibility in restoring the UI trust fund. So, you know, when we think about how Georgia's Department of Labor could leverage its budget to advance racial equity, modernizing its unemployment insurance system will be the first priority. Now, state audits, news media findings from official records requests, and research from state, regional, and national advocacy groups, which includes GDPI, have outlined the timeliness failures of UI claim adjudication, 
you know, the prevalence of under and overpayments to claimants and the economic hardships that result from that, and the multi-hour phone call cues that countless Georgians had to experience while they're trying to get a claim resolved, trying to get a question answered, which just caused, you know, so much more heartache, distress, and hardship. So, you know, modernization investments would have an outsized positive impact for racial equity in Georgia. And we expect that, you know, based on a number of data points. And you can um, change the slide now. Now, what we have, you know, what, what's there, you know, you're, you're seeing numbers from a few months earlier, but, you know, there's some numbers that just came out. So I'm going to give you, you know, the, the latest numbers when you think about, like, how we can expect modernization to make a difference, an outside difference when we think about racial equity. So for one, Black men continue to more than double the likelihood of experiencing unemployment than white men in Georgia, and Black women nearly double the likelihood of experiencing unemployment compared to white women in Georgia, and all that's according to data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the U.S. Census. Also, Black workers in Georgia represent 59% of all current unemployment insurance enrollees, while only representing about 30% of, of, of Georgia's workforce, and this is according to, you know, Department of Labor data. Now, one of the things, according to official records requests, under Georgia's current system, you know, Black workers during the height of the COVID-19 induced recession received a disproportionate share um, of, of denials to their UI claims, which would be attributed to a number of factors that include UI system inefficiencies. So, you know, AR, you know, American Rescue Plan investments, you know, and modernizing Georgia's UI system can make Georgia more resilient for the next economic downturn you know, and, and allow it to more swiftly respond to involuntary displaced workers who turn to the UI safety net. And also, you know, you know, when, just, when we think about an, an ideal, you know, way of, you know, where Georgia should be as far as the investments that it makes, you know, if, if Georgia lawmakers were to expand unemployment insurance accessibility to Georgia's growing non-traditional workforce, which includes gig workers, independent contractors, and part-time workers, a modernized UI system would be better equipped to protect this added pool of Georgians if they lose their jobs and no fault of their own. And then lastly, when we think about an ideal modernized UI system in Georgia, you know, it would better, you know, an ideal system would better reach those with language or cultural barriers. You know, Department of Labor enrollment data, enrollment data suggests that, you know, Hispanic workers who for years only made up about 1% of unemployment insurance enrollees in Georgia now consistently make up 5% of UI enrollees. Now this growth in enroll, this, this enrollment growth, you know, it could be a, a positive result um, of temporarily expanded federal UI benefit programs that may have heightened awareness, heightened their awareness of UI programs in Georgia. So with all that said, you know, we know that recessions, you know, they, they typically create the, the harshest economic displacement among workers and in lower income brackets. And those, and those, though they're, they're disproportionately represented by black and brown workers so you know we if we had a more resilient department of labor and a more resilient unemployment insurance system it would certainly have outsized impacts that could certainly put black and brown workers on a path to prosperity so i'll stop there and i will pass the mic all over to my colleague leah chan and, and let her continue great thanks so much ray um and you can go to the next slide so um, if there's anything that the past couple of years have taught us, it's that Georgia must have the capacity to adapt amid new health challenges and ever shifting conditions. And a key building block for a more resilient Georgia is a flexible, well-resourced public health infrastructure and healthcare system. Unfortunately though, Georgia's health system performance consistently ranks near the bottom and was ranked 47th in how our systems, our health systems responded to the pandemic. So increasing our state in investment in our health agencies can really prepare us for the next health emergency. Um, so the departments of behavioral health and developmental disabilities, community health and public health are the three primary agencies focused on our state's healthcare and public health systems. Georgia plans to provide $6.2 in total state funds for these three agencies in the 2023 budget year, which is about 20% of overall state spending. Next slide. So our Department of Community Health operates Medicaid and Peach Care programs. It conducts planning and regulatory functions and it administers the state health benefit plan that provides health care to teachers and state employees. 
And it accounts for 4.4 billion or about 71% of total state health spending. Medicaid and Peach Care serve about 2.3 million Georgians, which is about one in every five residents. Low income Medicaid serves children, pregnant women, and some parents with very low incomes. The aged, uh, blind, and disabled portion of the program serves older adults with low incomes, as well as individuals with physical and developmental disabilities. And then Peach Care is a separate program serving children from families with incomes that are above the Medicaid threshold, but who often lacks, lack access to other forms of coverage. So about 70% of Medicaid beneficiaries in Georgia are children covered by either Peach Care or the Low Income Medicaid Program. However, more than half of Medicaid spending actually goes toward the Age Blind and Disabled Program. Next slide. So the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities operates state hospitals and provides community-based services through contracted providers to Georgians living with mental health conditions, substance use disorders, and developmental disabilities. It also operates programs for forensic evaluation and treatment under the court system's jurisdiction. So this department accounts for 1.4 billion or 22% of the total state spending on health. And one thing I wanted to note is that communities across the country, including communities here in Georgia, are really grappling with drug overdose, which is an urgent and costly health crisis. And as you can see, state funding on addictive disease and substance use disorder only counts for about 4% of the DBHGD budget. So as we build out our response to this drug overdose crisis and work to really better support those with substance use disorders, we should really tap into those hundreds of millions of um, dollars coming to Georgia from settlements of lawsuits against pharmaceutical companies and others that were involved in the distribution and um, sales of prescription opioids. And it's really critical that we learn from the successes and mistakes of the tobacco settlement funding and the Olmstead funding by working with our lawmakers and state agencies to establish a system of accountability and transparency for how this opioid settlement money is spent and really ensure that decision-making is led by communities and those most impacted by the overdose epidemic. Next slide. So our Department of Public Health, um, <clears throat> it operates programs that are focused on disease and injury prevention, health promotion, and health-related disaster response and preparedness. And it accounts for 384 million, or about 6% of the total um, state spending on health. The largest state-funded programs provide funding to the 159 county health departments, um, help prevent the spread of infectious disease and provide services for children. So Georgia's public health programs also re receive really significant federal support. <clears throat> so federal money actually comprises 50% of the department's overall $792 million budget with state and other funds comprising the rest. Next slide. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about a win, a loss, and an opportunity that I see in the fiscal year 23 health spending. So first, one big win for health spending is the increase in benefits and salaries for health agency staff. So like other states, Georgia's health agencies have experienced significant staffing shortages over the past several years. And the 23 budget reflects efforts to address recruitment and retention including $5,000 cost of living increases for full-time staff and salary increases for certain positions like epidemiologists at the Department of Public Health and psychiatric hospital nurses at the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. We should continue these benefit and salary enhancements um, <clears throat> and get our health agency staff salaries to at least the market average. Um, people are really our most valuable asset at our health agencies, and our ability to withstand future crises um, depends in large part on our ability to recruit and retain a diverse and qualified workforce. Next slide. So for almost a decade, we've failed to fully expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, and that really shows up in our budget. 
So just one example, our failure to expand Medicaid forces uninsured Georgians to delay care and use the emergency room as a last resort. And instead of paying to keep those Georgians healthy, Georgia has set aside about $50 million in state funds for 2023 to offset the costs hospitals pay when uninsured people arrive in the ER with often preventable conditions. We have the third highest uninsured rate in the country, and the burden is heaviest on Georgians living in rural communities and Georgians of color, particularly Latinx Georgians. Expanding Medicaid could bring billions in federal funds to our state and provide life-saving care to hundreds of thousands of uninsured Georgians. It is really a racial justice imperative and also an economic no-brainer. Next slide. So behavioral health is really having its moment here in Georgia. In 2019, state legislators convened the Behavioral Health Reform and Innovation Commission, and in 2020, House Speaker David Ralston introduced legislation that built upon the findings of that commission and declared, no issue is more important to me this session than mental health. So that legislation, known as the Mental Health Parity Act, passed with unanimous bipartisan support. Fully expanding Medicaid could build upon that momentum by closing the coverage gap and delivering behavioral health care to more Georgians. So states that have expanded Medicaid have seen improved access to behavioral health care, lower rates of suicide, and reduced stress among people with low incomes. Expanding Medicaid could also help us boost our behavioral health workforce. So <clears throat> a little bit about next steps. So a growing body of evidence tells us that most of what keeps people healthy is not determined by what goes on in the doctor's office, but rather by the conditions in which people live, work, worship, and go to school. And most of our state health budget is really focused downstream on providing care to people who are already very sick or in an acute crisis. Moving upstream and investing in what helps people to stay well would not only save lives, but ultimately save money. So how do we make sure health spending delivers impact for those who've really been left without a shot at good health? So as I said in the beginning, it's really clear that a well-resourced public health infrastructure and healthcare system is a key building block for a more resilient and equitable Georgia. And we can use the budgetary tools at our disposal, like our remaining American Rescue Plan funds, the federal funding that comes with full Medicaid expansion, opioid settlement dollars, our state surplus, to increase our state's health investment and really create the conditions where all Georgians can thrive and achieve their best health. So I will pass it back now to my colleague Ray to talk about our criminal legal systems. Yes, thank you so much, Leah. And I'm just going to jump right into a conversation with you all about Georgia Department of Corrections. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of a conversation about things from a fiscal perspective and then just jump right in to try to make things a little more obvious for everyone about what what their spending is about so gc georgia department georgia department of corrections you know oversees all aspects of the state's prison system and has a fiscal year 2023 budget that is 1.28 billion um it, it's fiscal year 2023 spending is 71 million higher than fiscal year 2020's pre-pandemic budget and nearly 154 million uh, higher than fiscal year 2022 spending. So when you come just when we combine fiscal year 2023 spending with that, which was allocated, which was allocated uh, and passed for am amended fiscal year 2022, but just more simply now, when adding all of Georgia Department of Corrections spending that lawmakers approved during this past 2022 legislative session, Georgia lawmakers added 833 million in state cor correction spending. And more than 600 million of that went to prison construction alone. Now, aside from prison construction, the remaining 233 million in added spending will go to prison infra infrastructure upgrades, maintenance, increased pay for staff and benefits, you know, for them as well, uh, for public and private prison staff. And, and this serves as an attempt to boost staff capacity and morale and safely house incarcerated Georgians. But regardless of this, it perpetuates mass of course, incarceration and the forceful extraction of wealth and health from countless numbers of economically vulnerable Georgians and their families who for more reasons than this town hall has time for, places them at a disproportionate likelihood of having contact with Georgia's criminal legal system. So despite nearly a billion dollars in added spending, Georgia Department of Corrections maintains $2 million in pandemic cuts to healthcare spending for incarcerated Georgians, 
five million dollars in spending cuts that are made up by raising commissary prices that are often paid for by the loved ones and families, particularly women who support them. No, it maintains no public record of health co-pays for COVID-related illnesses. It maintains millions, if not billions, in unpaid prison labor. And it maintains no formal training for the unpaid labor that is often forced on those who are, who are, who are housed um, in Georgia's correction system. So millions of dollars that don't account for unpaid labor or formal job training don't protect those most vulnerable to persistent COVID transmission that continues to run rampant in Georgia's jails and prisons, chronic illness, or unpaid job in injury. All these things further finance Georgia Department of Corrections, the Georgia Department of Corrections on the backs of the incarcerated and help perpetuate an unjust fines and fees system that places long-term harms on returning Georgians. This is not public safety. Now, no ARP funds were used for anything with Georgia Department of Corrections, but they certainly could have. You know, for, for one of the most vulnerable populations of COVID-19, they could have been used to subsidize healthcare co-pays permanently, or at least for, for, for the long term or for, for much longer than they than they you know allegedly were. You know, for the counts of, of for the countless amounts of uh, Georgia Department of Corrections related fines and fees debts that are placed on those housed there, they could have been used to relieve vulnerable Georgians, vulnerable returning Georgians and their families from falling into unforgiving debt to spiral because of this. Um, you know, you know, particularly those who, who have been incarcerated, you know, who too often owe exponentially more in singularly profit-seeking fees more than their punitive fines or restitution debts. And you know, to make up for the raises, and you know, it could be it could have been ARP funds could have been used to make up for raises in commissary prices. And it also, even before that, it you know, when we beyond just the broad use of the ARP fiscal recovery funds, those who were incarcerated didn't even get stimulus checks when it came to um ARP funding. So from with, with all that there, you know, sadly, state lawmakers. You know, on both sides of the aisle, often see Georgia's carceral system as a means to compensate for lost revenue in other areas, and too often pass those costs onto those who are incarcerated and to the loved ones that support them. Again, this isn't public safety. I'll stop there, and I'll pass it on to David, our MC, to close us out. Thank you, Ray, and everyone. Uh, we appreciate y'all joining us tonight. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have everybody here. Uh, so, Stephen. Danny, Ray, Ife, Leah, thank you for being on a great panel tonight, and providing so much information about the budget audience. We thank you for joining us. Again, this is our primer, but this is your budget. This is the biggest, most important moral document that the state of Georgia passes every year. Uh, we have some suggestions on how to lean into the budget to make it better. Uh, we invite you to visit us at gbpi.org. I would like to say that we do not have time for questions tonight due to some technical constraints but we would love it if you could drop some of your questions in the chat and we will get back to you via email. And additionally, if you have follow-up questions after tonight, please drop them to us at gbpi at gbpi.org. Love that email address. It's one of the shortest ones I can think of that I can remember. And we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have those questions. And thank you so much to this great panel. Thank you, audience, for joining us. But again, we've got to cut it a little bit short tonight due to some technical constraints. And we wish you a good evening.